Uh, um, so how much is that? So. And welcome to the podcast editor's mastermind, the only podcast for the business of podcasting. I am your host for the evening, Carrie Caulfield. Eric, and you can find me at yayapodcasting.com. With me, I have... Daniel Abendroth. You can find me at rothmedia.audio. I'm Brian Ensminger. You can find me at toptieraudio.com. And to my side is... Jennifer Longworth of bourbonbarrelpodcasting.com. Now, if you're not familiar, Jennifer is one of our original co-hosts who took a hiatus and she thought this topic tonight was so fun, she wanted to join us. So welcome back, Jennifer. Thank you. Yeah. So on tap for tonight is a conversation that um, I think is had all over the podcast editing forums this time of year. Since it's the beginning of the year, we're starting things fresh and new. Lots of contracts expiring. We're going to be talking about raising your rates. Let me look at my little handy sheet here. because. Um... <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. The first thing is why? Would you raise your rates? Why not just keep clients at the same pay rate? And I I hope this is a pretty simple answer. I mean, there's a lot of possible answers to this one, but I guess the two that just kind of jumped to my mind, one, inflation, prices just go up. Price of goods and services always go up and we're no different. And two, like we get better. Like I'm constantly improving, (laughs) so... I really I'm like number my, two. Yeah, like I'm just I'm a better editor, I feel, than I was a year ago. Or like I'm offering better service than I was a year ago. Yeah. And I think you kind of lead into one of the other things that I see as a common thread. Like I'm raising rates because I'm adding video editing or I'm adding I'm doing value added services. And I think there's kind of two pieces of that, right? One is raising your overall rate by expanding the services that you offer. But the other is just like the cost of the actual service, right? So let's say that I've always added or I've always offered video editing. I could potentially raise my rates for that. But also just because I add video editing doesn't mean that I can't also raise the rate for my audio editing as I get better, as as inflation happens, as we add new capabilities and new skills. There's a lot of different facets, I think. And like for me, one thing that I've added is quality check. So now before any show goes live, there was at least one other person listening to every episode. That's just something I started doing to cover myself. But it's also like, hey, you now have a little more peace of mind to know that like your shows are going to go out properly, like sounding the best they can. Yeah, that actually kind of plays into one of the the things that I've been working on in terms of my path in terms of pricing structure, right, is I'm building in pricing for continuity. Right. So that as I start building out my small team and I have more redundancy, then I'm providing a service to my clients beyond just what I deliver to them. Right. Because as I get this built out, then they will know that there's a backup. If somebody gets sick, things don't have to go down. If something was to happen to me, we've got something in place so that the work can continue. I mean, there might be a couple of bumps, but it's not just like, well, we're 100 percent out of the game because Brian can't do anything for a week. I don't know. Jennifer, what do you think? Well, I think that there's, you all have mentioned the good reasons to raise your rates, but we also, when we're in a traditional job, we always want the boss to give us a raise, right? We always want to give a raise. Well, when you're your own boss, the only person in charge of giving you a raise is you. And if it's time for you to get a raise due to inflation, due to increased costs, whatever the reason is, well, you have to do it. You have to make that move. No one can do it for you. I'm going to be a little maybe controversial on this topic, but isn't it okay just to want more money? Yes, (laughs) I think so. Like, why do we always think that we shouldn't have more money? I mean, I feel like even as a culture, like, we're always like, oh, well, I want to raise because, or I don't want like too much. I want just enough. But I feel like there's a mindset there where, It's not okay to just want more money. It's that (laughs) scarcity mindset instead of the abundance mindset, right? 
there's a lot we could dissect that goes into politics and or <laughs> socioeconomics that probably be a little too controversial. But yeah, totally. Like yeah. we deserve more money because we want it. So this is a concept that a client actually talked about on her show, which I don't know if that was necessarily good considering she had a podcast editor because I'm about to ask her for more money. But <laughs> <laughs> just be like, hey, I was listening to this podcast. I can't remember which one. And the host said... I should want more money, right? I yeah. It's just okay to want more money. And I feel like that's very true. Like, um, I want to do more things and more things mm-hmm. cost money. And so I want yes. more. And I just, mm-hmm. you know, I want more glitter. Sorry. I want to go on another <laughs> cruise with my family. <laughs> oh, yeah, that. <laughs> yeah, I might want that too. I'm actually really glad that you mentioned that, Carrie, because it kind of plays into some of the comments that we saw When we asked this question in the Facebook group, the Podcast Editors Mastermind Facebook group, about people talking about questions about pricing, because there were a a number of comments in there that were related to things like imposter syndrome or feeling like I have to justify the value add or like even some of the stuff that I've talked about that's really more of a strategy than a why that I think is addressed by just understanding that it's okay to want to to prosper and to, to do well. Between you and Jennifer, we can probably just drop the mic and go home because Jennifer <laughs> yeah. had the, the quote like, about sorry, like, folks. yeah, see you later. You know, if you're if you're your own boss, the only person to give you a raise is you like those two are gold right there in my day job. It's OK for me to want more money and I don't have to justify why I want more money. Now, whether or not I get it comes down to a negotiation between me and my boss and whatever structures are set in place to make that not happen. But that's not a bad thing. I think that's really good. So I just want to take a quick. Second to welcome everybody that is going off in chat. Thank you so much for being here. If you're listening to the replay of this or watching the replay, be sure to join us every other Thursday at 9.05 Eastern time pretty regularly. Helen King said, yes, it is, Carrie. It's okay to want more. Kayla says, preach, Carrie. Totally cool. Just want more money. Mike Wilkerson, bravo and wanting more money, wanting to make money and then more money for what you dedicate. Up teen hours to is a good thing. Don't villainize the want to make more money. I'm so tired of it in all assets, outlets of life. Andrea also says, also your skills and expertise increase over time. So your rate should too. So it seems to be a common theme of like, yes, let's prosper. Let's all want more money. But so the thing we do for our clients is help them if they, you know, hopefully if they're running their podcast as a business or they're profiting from their podcast in some way, we are giving them the means in which to do that because they do not have to edit their podcast. We are doing it for them. We are making them sound awesome. We are making deliver a clear message. You know, we're working with them to do all the things. It is a transactional relationship. But as your client prospers more, you should also prosper more. At least that's my belief. Yeah, totally. And I think also to tie into that, I think there's a certain level of peace of mind that we as editors might forget about. But for those of you that have been following the show for a while, we used to offer different people the opportunity to edit the show for their portfolio. And we've stopped doing that. Well, because honestly, it created a lot of uncertainty as to whether or not we were going to be able to deliver our episode on time, partly because we're just working with a new person every time, but also partly because some of the people that thought they had the goods didn't. And now that we've got somebody in place who does this consistently and we pay him so he can keep doing it, shout out to Alejandro, it's very encouraging to get that episode every time and know that it's going to be right. Now, there might be things that we would have done differently. That's fine. Like there are always stylistic things, but to know that we've got something that we can just take and publish is great. As we provide that for our clients, that's a huge deal. And as we get better at doing that and as we, as that relationship develops, There's no reason that our value to them shouldn't increase. Absolutely. So I'm curious as, first of all, I'm going to have this caveat. Like I say this, this is kind of a new mindset for me. So I have not been great about raising rates until recently, right? It was a conversation I didn't want to have. It was a conversation I forgot about. Like just one day it's January, the next day it's December, So while I kind of have this mindset that, hey, I need more glitter in my life and somebody's got to pay for it, it's not going to be me. It's easy to say that, 
right? It's easy for us to all sit here with each other and be like, yeah, more money, but it's less easy to do it. So my first question for you guys and for everybody else in the chat is, so how often do you raise rates or is it not a regular practice for you? Not as often as I should. I think it was 2020 when we last raised our rates. Yeah, I think ideally, probably yearly, but yeah, I'm not uh, consistent with it at all. So for me, when it comes to new clients, I'm fairly good at keeping my rates updated. For a while, I was actually, every time I got a yes, the next client I charged more. And I feel like I've gotten to a good place right now where there's, I'm getting enough no's that I don't think it's time for me to increase my rates yet on that side. So that's been pretty, pretty good. It's the existing clients like Mike. Wilkerson mentioned in the chat as far as like that uncomfortable conversation. I know for me, when I talk about mindset, because Carrie, you talked about how it's easy to talk a good game and not necessarily walk the walk. I've got one client who I should have had the rate conversation with at the beginning of last year. So a year into the pandemic. And I put it off because I was like, well, I mean, it's, it's a rough time. I probably shouldn't have that conversation with her right now. And I'm like, now I'm looking back and going, well, it wasn't unrough for me. Just because it was rough for her doesn't mean that, that, and I know it sounds stupid when you say it out loud, but that's the head trash you deal with for an entire year going, oh man, I should have had that conversation. Well, but I mean, inflation and well, but, and now I'm like a year past that. I'm going, now I'm going, okay, we should probably be having a conversation about a 20% rate hike or more at this point based on how my pricing has increased over time while this client has stayed flat. And now I'm going, can I have a 20% pricing conversation. How do you sell that in to go? Because 20% is not insignificant in my mind. If I got a 20% raise at my day job, that's a pretty nice little raise. (laughs) Mike Wilkerson said something really, I think, important. If you don't initiate, then you will get dragged into complacency and the feeling that you can't raise your rates eventually. I think that's what he's saying. You can't buy the time. So I actually experienced that. Like one of my first clients, I didn't raise rates for like a year. And it was a lot. So it was, you know, it was one of those, you start out new, you're doing a low rate. And then I realized that like the time it takes to do all the pieces for his show, I wasn't even making a minimum wage. And I put it off and I put it off and I let it go and let it go. And I I think like another six months went by. And I remember talking to you guys about it. And y'all were like, yeah, raise weight rates. And I think what I felt like I had to do was like actually do the math for him about how many hours it takes to do the work and show him that I was not, I was making like $3 an hour. And that kind of shocked him, not as much as it shocked me. Of course. (laughs) But then we renegotiated. But I felt like I had to do that much justification of raising rates. And I'm still not great at raising rates regularly. Jennifer, what about you? So I am not good at raising them regularly, but I am in the process of, you know, doing the new people come on. There's a new rate. People ask me how much I charge. I tell them the new rate. I'm not even thinking about the old number now. Like it's the new number because one of my people already pays that number. I just do a little extra for him. So it's like, oh, well, he already pays it. Somebody else is already paying that. He just gets a little bit of extra love. Well, if he's paying this, somebody else probably will too, right? Right? (laughs) Oh, wait, they're paying that now too. Okay, great. But I'm not even having the conversation with the lower number. It took a while from my base rate of, you know, my first show being $25 or whatever. I've come a long way since then, but the... (laughs) (laughs) We all have. It's okay. The the doubling and tripling of the rate a few years ago was like, oh, now I'm legit. You know, so for those of... I, I don't see anyone, any beginners in the chat, but for beginners who are listening and lurking, you know, it's okay to start out at the $25, but don't stay there for long. If you figure out what you're doing, have that conversation as soon as you can, because 
Mike say you're going to end up getting stuck there forever. And I had a client who wanted to stay at the $25, $35 level. I was like, hey, yeah, I'm raising it up to 50, which is not where I am now. I'm higher than 50 now. But at that point, I was like, I'm going to raise it to 50. And you all might remember my agony over that potential conversation. I was just going to go to $50. Uh, And they said no. So I don't work for them anymore. And that's okay. Because now I have people paying me a heck of a lot more than that to do what I was doing before. The thing I like to remind myself, because I remember that with you, is every client that you lose at the old rate, if you've doubled the rates, you only need half of a new client to replace that. Right. So I understand that sometimes there are fixed costs that need to be covered. But a lot of what we do is really time-based. So it's really more variable cost. And so as long as your base costs are covered, losing a a low-paying client is not necessarily a bad thing. I don't like it. I don't like to lose relationships. And I think that's my challenge, right? To me, losing a client over pricing is like failing in a relationship. And I don't know why that is because I'm not even sure sometimes I like people, but there's that, right? (laughs) Well, you start to care, right? I do. You care about your client. You're listening to them like every week, sometimes multiple times a week. So you, just like a podcast listener, have that sense of intimacy with them. But it's like a false sense of intimacy because they're not listening to your voice every week. <laughs> they're only reading That's true. your emails. That's true. Um, so I don't think they're as connected, right? And where, you know, since we have that intimacy, we're putting so much, we're projecting so much into that conversation in our head because they care. And what if they're having problems? And oh, we don't want to make it harder for them. And so there's this whole emotional baggage we bring to it, right? That they don't even have or even think about. And I think the clients I have raised rates on or changed rates based on the scope of work, it was like, okay. It was easy. It wasn't as hard or as like, I didn't have to do all this hoop jumping. I thought I had or justification that I thought I would have to because they were looking at it as a transactional relationship instead of an intimate relationship, right? Yeah. I wonder sometimes if maybe that's why it's so frustrating when we get crap audio to start with and it feels like the client doesn't even care because that starts to like, maybe at some point we become over-invested in the relationship to where we care more about the quality of what they put out than they do. Well, I broke up with clients once and their their message to me was, oh, these minor edits you do for us. Blah, 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 blah. I was like, oh, Oh, that hurts. Oh, oh, no, no, thank you. We we don't work together anymore. And and I don't even remember what the rest of the email said, but the minor edits I do for you. Did you all listen to what you sent me? (laughs) Did you hear yourself or did you just, did you, oh man. Yeah. Here's my session with 275 edit points in 33 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. And Andrea has a good point. They also don't listen to their raw audio, so they don't know what magic we produce. Um, Though I have some clients who listen to the raw audio, so they do know what magic I produce. They happen to be the higher paying clients, oddly enough, which is an interesting correlation. So... That's really fun. I have new clients now and I'm listening to this about raising ranks regularly. I'm like, well, I'm more like have a rotating door, a revolving door of clients coming in and out. So people are pod fading or coming back on or whatever. So they just come back in. Someone's like, oh, I'm ready to come back now. I'm like, well, it's twice as much as when you left. So it's not like I'm raising rates on people regularly who are my clients. They just, it's, there's just enough turnover. Because I had uh, six years ago when I started doing this, I had a really crappy little clients and I'm glad I didn't work with any of them anymore. So I'm curious if you get pushback from people who come back and you're like, oh, I've doubled my rates. I'm waiting to hear back from that email. It's happening this week. We'll find out what happens. Stay tuned. What about you guys? Have you ever been in that situation? I think I'm going through that now. Well, not like returning clients, getting a higher rate, but just pushback on a new rate. And it kind of goes back to like the addition by subtraction. It's a client that I do audio editing with minor video editing. I don't do any major ones, but I still like take their raw video, throw on the intro and outro, clean up the audio and produce that along with show notes and like a descript captions. So it's probably like pretty time intensive, but they're one of the lowest paying clients 
because they've been with us for a while and we like the work that they're doing. So we've just kind of like been going along with the lower rates because of what they're doing. And it's got to the point where it's like we dread working on the show and it doesn't help that we're also making so little money off of it. So the rate is more than doubling. So we're giving them, so like the rate is like probably like 2.5, almost three times as much. And then we're giving them a little bit of a discount because they've been with us for so long. And we know like it's just not in their budget. So it's more than double what their current rate is. And so the response I got back is we're doing the budget soon, but it's probably not going to be feasible. I've never really had a customer leave and come back. I had one that had to pause the show during a work transition. They came back or they restarted the show. At that point, the rate had gone up by about 20%. But part of that was also we went from monthly billing to per episode. And I just shared with them, when I agree to do this with you and this kind of timeline, I have to make sure that I maintain a certain amount of headroom in my work week so that I can produce this show for you. So in order to do that, I'm going to have to charge a little bit more because the income is more variable, but so is the workload. And honestly, I'm thinking at this point, I'm wondering if double my monthly rate is actually the right price for intermittent episodes that aren't on a regular schedule. Because if I've got my week fully booked, in essence, based on what my clients provide me, and I've got a client that provides me a three-track, one-hour episode that needs to be turned around in seven days, just like everybody else, that's extra weekend work. And depending on the complexity of what they do, that could be three, four, five hours of editing, especially if it's like a host and two guests or something like that, where it's just a mess to deal with. So I'm actually thinking maybe 20% isn't enough of an upcharge to have an inconsistent workload. Yeah. And so one of the things that I always say to like, not maybe to clients, but to other editors is that it's not so much that they're paying for editing, right? It's that they're paying for a slot in my schedule to edit right? Because my time is the most valuable thing I have. And I actually am kind of in the same situation you are, Brian, where I'm I'm getting ready to, I have an inconsistent client. I never know when I'm going to get a file. And the last couple of times they sent me something, they were like, oh, can you get this out ASAP? And I'm like, what do you describe as ASAP? Like, (laughs) There's only so much flexibility here if you give it to me on a Thursday. And and usually the answer is, you know, no, I can have it by this date, but I can't have it by this date. And so I've come to a point where I'm going to have to make a decision whether to charge them significantly more or to just drop them all together. And they're so inconsistent, though. And it's sometimes such a struggle. That's the other thing. They want me to cut out like all the adjectives. They They have a legal review department. So like anything that's interesting gets cut. And so it's incredibly sad to edit as well. (laughs) So it's not bringing me joy and it's inconsistent. Well, Marie Kondo would tell you that since it doesn't spark joy, you should let it go. Should we have that approach as business owners? I don't know, but it works for clothing. I, I, her on the show. Paper. I, I think it works for <laughs> possessions. I'm not sure it works the same for. <laughs> I for want it book. to work for, I want the work I do to make me happy. Yeah. Yeah. Because otherwise, why am I? I mean, I could just go get a job somewhere else, right? A lot less stress that way. Or different kind of stress, I guess. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah. That. Well, yeah. you know, a stress <laughs> that you don't have to own, though, because when somebody calls to complain, they're not calling you, right? Unless you're like, you know, a CEO or something of a a company, I am being dragged. Uh, What does being dragged mean, Mike? I'm not sure what that means. The drag he's referring to is a feeling that we all have. One, you're doing the work. Two, you're not being paid enough. Three, the work seems like it's not stopping. Four, you're quickly losing interest and footing for the job because you're on the cusp of being dragged and then you're being dragged. Yes. Okay. So it's just like that. Yeah, not making enough. You're putting in the work and just like losing I, interest. I, yeah. Yeah. I'm just being, you know, they're just, they've got my arm and they're just pulling me along and, and my clothes are all dirty now. Yeah. Um, and it's also, <laughs> it's a disservice for you, but it's also a disservice for your clients because once you lose interest and you feel this obligation and discouragement about the show, you're suddenly like not putting in the same effort 
as you would like the shows that you really love working on. Mike, can I come work for you? It sounds like you're, you're good to work <laughs> you for. You need to listen to the last episode. Yeah, has- I do. And actually, I haven't. I'm sorry, everybody. I've had COVID, so I've been away. But um, That's no excuse. We accept yeah. that excuse, don't we, Daniel? <laughs> you still work. Two types of people. Um, yeah, so that's... I don't know where I'm going with this anymore. But, so, um, <laughs> somebody I, help. I did, I, I did want to talk just a, a second about something that I'm considering that doesn't have anything to do with pricing. But I've considered making my minimum turnaround time for any show no less than the cycle between episodes. So if you have an every other week show, I expect two weeks to turn around your episode. And if you've got a once a month show, one month, that way that inconsistent workload can be spread out differently. I don't know if I'm going to go down that path, but it's something I've been thinking about because time management is one of my biggest challenges. I've started with three to five days. Three to five business days turnaround is in my contracts now because... You know, stuff happens. <laughs> like you get COVID and sometimes you can't do a quick turnaround. Um, sometimes some shows take longer. Yeah. It, it really Whenever I do my next updates, one of my policy changes is going to be how I handle rushed delivery. So right now, like I asked for seven days, but the rush delivery doesn't kick in until three days before release. And then there's like another upcharge if it's like within 24 hours. But now like I've done so much, like, I'm not even going to consider 24 hour turnarounds anymore. I have that. I put it, I've been putting in my contracts now that just, this is a Steve Stewart thing. Like he says, you have to buy his wife flowers. I say you have to buy my family dinner at our favorite restaurant now for 24 hour turnaround. (laughs) Nice. How much? Uh, No, my favorite restaurant, which is really expensive. Oh, Uh, nice. (laughs) Denny's. (laughs) <laughs> Jenny's <laughs> no it's called the foxhole and I'll say it's the one restaurant yeah. in her community yeah <laughs> it's a one nice. nice restaurant it's a one restaurant you get a steak <laughs> so I- I'm wondering if you guys can help me because we've established that I need to have this conversation so can you guys kind of coach me through how to how to key up this conversation that with my client that's been put off for over a year now and this is about the turnaround time no no price or the rates like, I've got this oh. client that I was like, okay, it's COVID. I'm not going to pass that cost on. Now we're potentially looking down the barrel of a 20% increase. Help me get over my junk. <laughs> it was a point that I had thought of earlier. And Mike, at some point, brought it up, I think. But it's the longer you put it off, the harder the conversation is. And not just because like you've been doing it, like it's been so long. But also, if you should have, quote unquote, should have, like, you felt like your rates should have gone up 20% last year. Does that mean that your rates should be now 40% over what they are because you didn't do it last year? And every year, you're That's not raising math. your Well, yeah. But I was like, thinking like 10, 10. Sure, sure, sure. Oh, okay, okay. So now, so now you're having a conversation about 20% instead of 10%. So if you are, anybody listening, having a hard time, just know like the, each year you put it off, bigger that, the harder the conversation is because like the more you need to raise just to kind of stay on par. Could you also present it as I have, I I don't know what, how you broach these conversations with clients, but, you know, could you just kind of highball them and be like, well, I, this is how much I've raised rates for clients over the past two years or whatever over the past year and and do the, give them the 40% number. And if they come back and say that you can't do that, then give them the, the break which is really what you're asking for. And then they'll feel like they're getting a deal, right? Like you're cutting them some slack and you'll feel like you're getting what you want. Want to play devil's advocate to that? Because I think actually you gave me, I had that idea one time in one of our private meetings and you gave me some contrary advice. Oh, did I? That sounds like Not to discount your service, not to devalue it like that. Oh yeah, because I don't like to discount service at all. So I'm just throwing that out there. Yeah, but I think... That's just kind of a counterpoint. No, I don't like to discount, but I I think negotiating mm-hmm. is a little bit different than discounting. I'm not going to give you a coupon, right? But since you're a value client, I'll give you like, you know, a price that I like still. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, the other thing is, are you okay with losing them, Brian? 
That's a tough one because they're a significant part of my business revenue. They're probably 30%. So it's not an insignificant account. So that always makes me nervous. Um, and that's one thing. You, you know, too? I, oh, <laughs> yeah, well, of course. Because one of the things, I have one big client and I'm, I've am i been taking on more clients just so I don't have all my eggs in one basket, mm-hmm. right? Because what if there's not a next project? But what if they stop podcasting and it's 30% of your business? You know, what if sure. they decide, what if they die tomorrow? I mean, we're in a pa- pandemic. That could actually happen. <laughs> um, so what's the solution to that? Would you be able to find a new client? I mean, potentially. Replacement value right? or replacement costs. Well, how much time and energy would it take for you to replace that client? Yeah. I mean, honestly, I don't know how to answer that because I don't have a good marketing program, which is a completely different episode. You don't, you don't know <laughs> your customer acquisition costs? No, I, I really don't because I, I probably acquire one or two a year, not like 10. I wonder how many people in the audience know their customer acquisition costs, Steve Stewart. That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> Not to tell us what it is, just if you know it. I mean, maybe mine would be zero because they come to me. But no, you still have to have a conversation with them. You still have to write a contract. You still have to like um, figure out what it is they need. There's still work that goes into getting a customer because I thought that and I was schooled the other way. Or you can be a moron like me and advertise and then that gives you spend you lots of money and get you nothing. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm sure it didn't get you nothing. I got you brand awareness. Yes, I've gotten my brand awareness, but it's an overpriced brand awareness. <laughs> Referrals, everybody. <laughs> and the, and experience <laughs> as question. well. Yeah. So, and then you pass that, you, you pass those costs to your customers, right? I guess one thing I, as we were talking, I did remember, and I think we talked about it last week privately as well. In terms of starting that conversation, if that's uncomfortable and you're a member of the Podcast Editor Academy, there's actually an email script in there. It's under the sales scripts section. That's something that I probably should have remembered was available to use because that will at least help take some of the emotion out of writing that email. So you don't have to sit there and stare at a blank screen in fear. You can instead take a look at what somebody else wrote and then tweak it to meet your needs. So that's Maybe one good way to start the conversation or at least to to send the information off. I don't know. Yeah. So what we did last time we raised rates was we went through each client, how much they're making, blah, 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 kind of did the numbers. And uh, then we sent out an email being like, here's our new rates. Here's the date that's going to affect. If you have any questions, if you want to get on a call to talk about it, you know, more than welcome. My initial reaction was like, I feel like this should be a face-to-face conversation. Like I need to like talk to them on a phone call or like on a video call to explain this and our business coach and my wife was like no we don't need to do that we just send the email because this isn't a big deal like this our rates are going up in a story so i think a really kind of unemotional way to start the conversation is by sending out this email like a breakdown like here's the new rates here's when they go into effect do you have any question and then they can reply being like hey blah 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 and then you kind of have that conversation back and forth then but i think the easiest way to start it is through just kind of sending an email and Brian, I'm curious. I'm just thinking about like the mindset side of this. So how many clients have you raised rates on that quit you? Zero. But I've seldom raised rates without an additional value exchange. So most of my, I had the one that went on hiatus and came back on a different production model, right? So they went from every other week to whenever they could get one done. And I've had a couple where adding value-added services have impacted the pricing in a way that out of scale with what it takes for me to do it. So it's increased my margin as well as increasing my rate, but it's not just like your editing cost is going up. To say zero is a little bit unfair, but also true. So really the only one that I've ever raised rates on, just purely rates is this client that I need to have the conversation with. I did raise rates on her from... 19 to 20 is really that 20 to 21 and now 22 gap that I need to close. So there's a chance that she knows she's lucky. Everybody. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so what is wrong for just raising the editing rates? 
it's just an unknown. I don't like things that I can't plan and strategize and have in contingency. F- I mean, you've how long uh, yeah, have I we don't, known I'm each other? Way. Your analytical <laughs> yeah. Lines. yeah. Yeah. I mean, if I can't write it down in my playbook and have like, okay, in case of <laughs> do this, it's tough. Yeah. And Bethany makes a good point is she always tries to keep in mind that podcasting is not really a necessity. We don't owe anyone affordable editing. And she says she's still working on getting her rates up to where she needs them to be. And that's true. So I feel like if you are a podcaster and you are paying for editing, then that is part of hopefully a business plan or your hobby expenses. Right. And so that you can afford that. So I don't think there's anything wrong with raising rates on just editing. But maybe another way to approach this, Brian, is doing less. I have one client who actually his podcast editing is paid for by fundraising that he does. Um, It's through the University of Texas. So like they also control the money. Is in a situation where he only has so much left in the budget for the year. So we had to figure out how I could keep editing for him and he could keep the show going without me taking a severe pay cut because I wasn't going to do that, essentially. So one of the things that we decided is that we would drop some services. So now it's I only do editing for him and it works out that I'm actually making a little bit more money because it was the other stuff that was more time consuming. Oh, Mike, you'll disagree with me. <laughs> <laughs> no surprise there. Uh, <laughs> so the one thing Mike said was he'll disagree with Bethany, only that it is a necessity for the client they're paying you because it is a necessity. And I, I, I agree with that. I mean, they're getting something from it, right? And they're not editors. And then, you know, but that, I mean, I guess that's a very nuanced conversation um, that we don't have time for today. And then Mike's going to go ahead and disagree with me. Dangerous um, thing. I used Carrie. to like you, Mike. I don't know what happened. <laughs> um, never work backwards on a service set. Um, I can't afford. And then let's start pruning shears and whatever. In this case, Mike, I was very glad because it was actually, I don't want to do that other stuff. I just want to edit. Right. <laughs> so it, it worked out. I got to do what I wanted win, win. and make more money at the same time somehow. But I think that, you know, if you really want to keep a client, I don't think there's anything wrong with just trying to find a creative solution to that. Can someone bring up Steve's comment about I'm about to have the raising rates combo with oh, the yeah. clients? So I'm about to have the raising rates combo with a few clients. They're invited to schedule a call before the new rate goes into effect in two months. And then another email reminder two weeks later and a final the week before is the only way I can stir up the courage to bring up the conversation. It's like a, you already are my client funnel. The schedule the email, <laughs> forget about it, and it's out of your hands. Yeah. No, I like that. This is a question for Steve. Is that something that you schedule at the time that you set your pricing in 11 months, send this first email out or whatever that timing is? Or do you uh, send it out? Like, do you actually send it out two months prior? I'm wondering, like, are you working up the courage when you... It's random. Oh, no. (laughs) (laughs) That's even better. Okay. (laughs) I'm just, I'm trying to think, like, is there a way that I can get myself over the courage by like claiming the win that I just closed this client to get that pre-scheduled and forget about it. (laughs) So, I mean, maybe that's an idea. So one of the things I've done to initiate conversations with clients more recently is have my husband write the emails. (laughs) And then I'm just like, take out Mm -hmm. all the, you know, I tell him to take out this, this, and this. It's much easier to like be bossy to him than it is to like sit down and like look at it and write it myself. So that has been a strategy that has been successful. And I feel like Daniel has that same strategy. <laughs> it's have his oh, does John write his emails too? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I call Carrie's husband. But hey. Yeah. I mean, you all can. Like for like 25 bucks, he'll write y'all's raisin rates emails. So that's fine. Yeah, I have a good system with my wife with the uncomfortable email. So I'm much more um, blunt (laughs) in my email, whereas she has much more empathy written into it. So like if somebody says like, hey, I had COVID, I'm so sorry, my stuff's late. 
blah, blah, blah. I'm like, oh, okay. But you're like, oh, I'm so sorry you had COVID. But like, and just like much more. Uh, you know, I didn't tell my, this is interesting because I didn't tell my clients I had COVID at all. Oh, sure, sure. I'm just kind of throwing out like whenever a, customer, or a client like, sends me an email, I'm like, oh, okay, well, here's what you need. Whereas Michelle is just like much more conversational. So like she'll start the process and then I'll go in being like, okay, tweak this, tweak that. And then we'll kind of go back and forth a little bit and then just send it out. Okay. So she's your John. Cause I have to exactly. do that with my husband. Okay. Yeah. It's a lot easier for both of us to do this process. So I don't know what that means for you, Brian. It may be John can write the email for you too. I'll probably just have to start with Steve's template. Yeah. There you go. That's a good <laughs> idea. <laughs> Which is again, at podcast editor academy.com. That's just one of the things that's available there. And I should remember that it's there, but sometimes I forget <laughs> the, I think the one question that I'd like to ask for the chat is if you haven't had this rate conversation, when are you going to do it? Yeah. I'll pick it while we wait for that to come in. I do want to point out Steve's comments. So we're going back to him raising his rates and he says he hasn't raised rates in a long time. So like, don't beat yourself up. Don't feel guilty. If you've been pushing this off, I've been doing it. I think Carrie said you were doing it. Yeah. Like this is something we all do. We all struggle with this. So like, there's no reason to feel guilty. This is just some advice and help that we're all trying to take in in order to make sure that we're getting paid what we deserve. Another moment I had. So in, you know, working for a corporate podcasting company, I was privy to like a sound designer team who got an episode and they said, oh, I mean, the, literally the email they said was, this is 30 minutes beyond what we agreed to and we need more money for it. Like literally that was their email. And that was kind of a mind flip for me. Like, and then I guess the producer wrote back, okay. Yeah, I think Andrea mentioned earlier about um, SaaS companies raising their rates. So like I use Dropbox. I think a lot of people here do. They raised their rates last year. They didn't say anything about it. They didn't justify it. They just said, hey, our rates are going up and we're going to pay it because we have to. I didn't even know they raised rates, to be honest with you, <laughs> until you just <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess I need to update my uh, expenses spreadsheet. But yeah. Oh, Bethany said she had the same rate since 2018. She did a two-step process. They went up a bit in January and would go up a bit more in July. It went over well. Wow. That's awesome. That's encouraging. That is. Did you lose? I'm curious. Did you lose any clients, Bethany? While we wait for that, for Bethany to respond. I, think <laughs> I did mine, I think, like I said, in 2020. It went over well as well. I think I had like one or two people kind of question it, but nobody left. I mean, that's awesome. I started doing it um, last year. I did one last week. I still haven't heard back from him, unfortunately. And I didn't, I only raised, well, I raised the rates 25%. I have some wiggle room in there if he comes back to negotiate. But I still have a couple more I need to do. And I'm just, one I'm just putting off because... It's not a fun conversation. No, it's not a fun conversation at all. But it's a fun outcome if everything goes well. It is a fun outcome. It is. And like, this is probably, and honestly, the one I'm putting off, this is one of the shows, it takes me the least amount of time to do, even though the rates aren't super high, but I have, I like, you know, it takes me like an hour to do a show. And so like, I put a lot of money in my pocket. I do it myself. And, you know. I get paid a lot an hour to do her show, but simply because I haven't raised rates in so long, I feel like it's, it goes back to that thing. Like, is it complacency? You know? Um, oh, Mike. Yes. Okay. I'm dragged. <laughs> <laughs> I'm dragged. All right. I just don't like people rejecting me ultimately, I think. Because it's not one of those things where I hate the work or it's hard to do or whatever. It's just, I don't want her to go somewhere else. And I think that she's one that potentially could. Netflix just raised their rates too. Oh, Did they? Ways. Everything's going up, actually. I mean, that right there is the number one reason to raise your rates as a podcast editor. If Netflix, Netflix is raising yeah. their rates, then you need to as well. Otherwise, how will you listen through all those shows and find all of the errors in the dialogue editing 
to make sure your skills are up to snuff. Are we ready for the pod decks question of the day? Did, did, was there anything I we needed so. to hit that we didn't? Uh, did you want to come back to Bethany's response, Carrie? Oh. oh, she said, no, some of my clients are still on hourly. I was worried about them because I went from $30 an hour to $50 an hour, which is actually, uh, you know, I would go up from that when I guess she said she was getting her rates where they need to be. All right, I'll stop. The flat rate clients felt easier to pitch to, but nobody left me, which is has me questioning that I'm still too low. And yeah, where is Brittany Felix today? <laughs> because she would say... Yeah, that's absolutely too low because mm-hmm. people need your rate. What does she say? 50%, I think. Yeah, but if like they're keep still saying raising yes. that until somebody says no, but everyone keeps saying yes, that you can still keep going up. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's what I do with new clients. But I still would like to have the conversation eventually to get everyone on flat rate per episode. I like the flat rate per episode. Well, I do monthly. Because I don't want to spend the time calculating every month of how much their invoice is going to be. Hourly is eventually, like this one client show, if I were to charge her hourly, I wouldn't make as much money. Because it only takes me an hour. Yeah. I do want to hit Mike's last comment. Not only are they raising, he's talking about Netflix. Not only are they raising their rates, they aren't raising the quality. In fact, I would argue being a Netflix payer, that the quality has actually degraded over the past couple of years, and yet the cost is going up, which makes me feel like maybe I shouldn't be scared to raise my rates since the quality of what I'm doing is at minimum as good as what I did before. And in my opinion, better. <laughs> right? In my ever so humble opinion of my own abilities, <laughs> I think it's gotten better. I don't think anybody argue with you on that one. No, I don't so, think so. Oh, you've heard the early stuff? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I remember when I thought I was so good. Oh, yeah. my goodness. Yeah. Are we ready for a quad decks question of the day? Yes. Are we sure. ever? Jennifer, <laughs> since you're our special guest, I need a number from one to five. So nobody has a, a leg up on the question. Three. Number three. It's a magic number. Oh, this is too easy. All right. Oh, okay. Number one. If you number had two. to teach a class on what on one thing, what would you teach? Okay, change it because we all know the answer. Next yeah, And question. it can't be podcasting. How's that? <laughs> oh, it can't, it can't be podcasting. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> if you ask it, so, and it can't So, Daniel, you teach karate? No, I wouldn't. Okay. <laughs> oh, maybe I would because it'd be hilarious. I have no idea what I'd be doing. Uh, networking. Networking? Like how and why. And I did it at Podfest Origins. And I've told her she should teach networking. I would probably teach a class on how to use Excel to do things you never thought Excel should do. I can see I that. To learn that. I would actually teach researching your family tree. Ooh. Yeah. With a focus on understanding um, how to gather information from a census document. <sighs> wow. Because they can tell stories. It's crazy. Daniel? I'm coming up blank. <laughs> I'm thinking like basic PHP, MySQL. Very basic. <laughs> yeah, outdated PHP practices. <laughs> Steve says personal finance basics in one hour. Daniel, I know there's a secret talent there somewhere we're not talking about. I'm sure there it, is. It may not be suitable for a family show. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so. so, Steve, I would love to see you have a basic business finance class yeah, see? for a podcast. I keep wondering, like, that's something I've always wanted from the podcast editors academy. Like, yeah, I suppose we're not supposed to host this show and ask other people to do stuff though. Or, I mean, like, <laughs> no, that's, that's what I do. That's my skill. <laughs> oh, that's right. That is, that's what Carrie could teach a class on I how keep, to ask stuff. <laughs> how to ask you to do it. stuff for me. <laughs> oh dear. That's funny. Well, Andrea says singing, and Helen said, I would teach people how to pick things up with your feet. Valuable skill. <laughs> Mike Wilkerson said, I would toss paper airplanes in Brian's class. <laughs> Most everyone would. And he <laughs> said he would teach people how to raise the rates of their karate instruction. Or karate, karate course, <laughs> whatever. I can teach people how to raise their teaching 
Rachel. Some, yes, it, was, it was a joke based on Daniel's yeah. thing. I yes. completely ruined the joke, which is yeah. probably why. <laughs> I, mean, I wasn't supposed to agree with that, was I? Sorry, Carrie. <laughs> if people are watching live, then they got to appreciate the joke before it was ruined. So yeah. you should join <laughs> us in two weeks and join us live on the podcast Editor's Mastermind on Facebook. Just follow the page and get notified when we go live. Yeah. And it's usually 9.05 p.m. Eastern, Eastern time. time. Yeah. And, and, and if, if you... Oh, oh go, go ahead. ahead. No, you're actually... <laughs> I was just no. going to mention... Uh, I'm really excited about the episode that we have planned for next week. We're still working out some of the details. I'm sorry, in two weeks. We want to talk podcast websites for podcast editors, right? So what needs to be on your site? What doesn't need to be on your site? What are some basic best practices? We're hoping that maybe we can bring on a guest who will do a live teardown of our sites here, like just a short one, just to sell us all the stuff we're doing wrong so that you can all learn from what we've done wrong. And then hopefully a way that we can connect people to that person to take it further if they want to go further. Because building websites, that's not my core skill. It's something I can do, but it's not a thing I'm great at. We want to bring on somebody that's great at that to help give us a leg up. So I'm really excited about that. I'm still working on the guests, but I'm really hopeful. And if you guys know anybody that you would recommend or that works on your website as a podcast editor, and Alejandro, you can cut this out in post. But just leave it in the chat and we will, you know, do the rest. Or email us at uh, um, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, at podcasteditorsmastermind.com. And um, Daniel, if they would like to be a guest on the show, how do they go about doing that? All you got to do is go to podcasteditorsmastermind.com slash be a guest, fill out the form. I think it's finally my email system has got itself sorted. So it's not automatically marking it as spam. So there's a good chance that it won't go to my spam folder first before I see it. Is that it? Is that all the stuff we need to do? I'm just mm-hmm. lost. I don't know what to do if it doesn't go to Daniel's spam folder. <laughs> oh, yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> okay. Well, we appreciate all of you being here with us live. Don't forget to join us for the next one in two weeks. Cut that out in post. I am Carrie Caulfield. Eric, you can find me at yayapodcasting.com. I'm Daniel Abendroth. You can find me at rothmedia.audio. I'm Brian Entzminger. I don't know why you'd want to, but if you do, you can find me at (laughs) toptieraudio.com. And next to me is... Jennifer Longworth of bourbonbarrelpodcasting.com. And we will see you next time. Uh, Um, So, How much is that? Um, um, uh, Um... um, 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 um. um. <laughs>